Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now you will know if you watch the programme regularly that one of our main preoccupations is the state of the West and Western culture at the moment and the need to preserve it and to celebrate it. Indeed, we have a six-part series called The West, which we're working on at the moment, which will be coming out uh, later this year. We also have our conference coming up, which is indeed all about the same subject. So I'm very pleased that we have a guest today who was first on the programme two years ago. Uh, the artist John Long started something called the Renaissance Workshop um, in 2017. Along came the pandemic and in many ways helped the business because now it is a global thing. Um, it is about actually connecting people to Western art and in particular certain parts of Western art. Um, that was a rather kind of convoluted way of explaining what you're doing, John. But can you just tell us, you know, when you came on, it was, uh, as I said, two years exactly, I think. The thing has grown hugely. What is it you're doing with the Renaissance Workshop? Well, I do a range of different online programmes to, to enable people to interact with a range of different historical things, especially revolving Western art. Western art and the mythology, belief and drama, storytelling, all different aspects of Western, traditional Western art and culture. And I deliver that in a range of different, range of different sort of uh, drawing classes and also workshops which, where we discuss ideas and courses as well. So anyone can really be involved. Anyone can join up. And anyone can join yes. up. Yeah, certainly. So there's just a, a, a free drop-in class every, every week. And it's where people can attend the Drawing from History workshop, which is now one of the central offerings that I, that I provide. And it's a completely open and free-to-access live Zoom um, workshop. And we deal with lots of different uh, subjects and artists and regions yeah and so basically people all ages get involved and i mean is it sort of doing what you hoped it would do i mean what, what was your aim i mean i know you this is what it's about but what, why did it come about now it seems very interesting because the west is all everything to do with the west is very much in the air yeah it is and i think that you, are you asking about my why where my project came from or yeah. or, or Yes. Well, well it was really for me, actually, and my personal need and the sort of need to connect to something that has shaped our culture mm -hmm. and wanted to feel a sense of immediate and direct contact mm -hmm. with what has shaped meaning in our world and what provides value and what can provide meaning and value for an individual life. And I was always just... I just felt a, a, you know, a gravitational pull to the old masters, you know, mm. first off being incredibly attracted to painters of the 17th century, like mm. Rembrandt and Franz Hals. Yeah. And uh, because they seemed to paint in a way which had a real, it, it punctured through the superficial appearances of things and mm. seemed to actually want to engage yeah. with what yeah. it is to be a self you yeah. know and the questions of selfhood and the mind and yeah. mortality and also morality as well you know so if you think of you know even your ambassador's painting here it questions it asks questions about um life itself and uh mortality and the transience of life and actually john you know you you, you i'm glad you brought it up because you see a lot of people who watch always pointing out things like i've painted things in the background you just mentioned a few themes there. I mean, where, does, where do we see those in the... What is, how does the picture convey those? Well, this is Holbein, by the way. Holbein's picture of the Ambassadors, which is in the National, National Gallery. Gallery. Well, I mean, if, well, one thing, you have the body language. You know, in traditional Western art, if you think about the earliest figurative Western artworks, are actually derived from Egypt, Egypt mm. with the Kuros, and they're very static and symmetrical. Yeah. But um, Polycletus introduced the contrapposto with his Doriferous. And that's the beginning of naturalistic 
representational art in, 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 in Western culture in the 6th century BC. And as you can see, we've got two very different postures here. And so it's the posture is what will telegraph the moral status and, yeah. and what is within the mind. And it's the movement and poise of the body, which is a very central value in representational art in Western culture. And what so, are they showing then? Well, Georges de Selve on the, on the left is with, you know, modi far more modestly, and he's covering his, his lower yeah. body with yeah. his, uh, with his uh, cloak oh, yeah. and, the, and the fur cloak. So he's much more modest, whereas Jean de Dondeville is showing his calf. Right. And, so, and, and in Elizabethan, well, no, we're, we're, we're pre-Elizabethan here because this is, uh, this is Henry the, under the reign of Henry VIII. Yeah. Um, Jean de Dondeville is the um, ambassador to France, and he's revealing his muscular calf. Yeah. And in that period of time, Men were expected to have quite robust upper bodies, you know, yeah. when they're, especially when they're wearing armour, you know, yeah. with enormous pauldrons on their shoulders, but to have very, very elegant and uh, slender legs for yes. dancing, because men were expected to dance. So if you were yeah. at the court of Henry VIII or if you were at the court of Maximilian, um, you're expected to dance all night and joust all day. But then we also have sort of moral themes, such as the anamorphic skull, which is now, spread sorry, across... Sorry, can you explain it? Because people see, won't be able to see that. This is a famous... Oh, yeah. You know, whenever you want to get kids in, interested yeah. in the National Gallery, you take them to one side and yeah, you yeah. stand right over here. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a skull at the bottom. But there are two, aren't there? There are two. When, so where's, where's the other one? <laughs> well, OK, so in order to see the first skull, as you said, you have to stand to the side. Or when it was originally hung, we think that it may have been hung on a, on a staircase and you would have walked up and you would have seen the skull from below. Oh, and the anamorphic see. vision would have sort of normalised as you were at that angle. Yeah. But the other skull is actually on Jean de Dondeville's cap. There's a little silver uh, or, or maybe oh. pewter or lead skull. You will see it on the print. I, yeah. You can see it on the print. And we've also got the, uh, the crucifix on the top left. Right there, right up in the Yeah, middle. behind yes. the green. And these things all obviously are symbolic of various... Yes. All these, so we've got... High the, callings. Yeah. yeah, the high callings. Right. So what we would call high, high culture now or what? Yeah, the high callings. So you've got astronomy, um, navigation, literature, music. There is a broken string on the lute, which is uh, symbolic of discord. But I think that the most immediate and the most obvious uh, visual element that will intuitively, intuitively resonate with, with, with anyone, whether they're a Westerner or not, is the, is the body language, I think. Yeah. And, because, and I think especially for someone who's been brought, in, brought up in Western culture, someone who, who, whose vision and whose life has been shaped by Western tradition, the the the, bod the body is really the central thing in Western yeah. art. Okay? Yeah. So it's what that's what distinguishes um, Western art from Egyptian art in yeah. antiquity. Yeah. You know, we were very e Egyptian influenced in those early days in you know in all sorts of in all sorts of ways, um, you know, philosophically and also artistically. But it was um, Polycletus who who really really made that epochal shift to, yes. towards naturalism and movement yes. with uh, the asymmetry of the natural body. And <laughs> that's the legacy there. And I, that's another point that one of the things that I really want people to understand and to get across is that you can't actually understand, you know, people often say that, you know, understanding history helps you understand how the world got to where it is. And knowing history, knowing a bit about history helps you not to repeat the mistakes of the past. I don't, well, they might be, by be true. Mm. That to me isn't the most important thing. I think that understanding history and having access to history and developing an understanding of what has shaped things tells you what things actually mean. Yes, yeah. It's not just how we got to where we are or not repeating past mistakes. It's understanding what things actually are yeah. and understanding that connection with polycletus and the, the development of the naturalistic pose actually informs you about what's actually happening here mm. and what this piece actually is. Mm. You know, having a more three-dimensional view of things. Yes. Yes. So that's what I'm really aiming to do. Yeah. You know, that brings me to the, the real aim of these Drawing From History workshops, you know. And you use, or so Drawing From History, but you also use uh, live models, don't yeah. you? Use, use that as well. And, well, and collaborate with live models. Yeah. yeah. And then also uh, you have sort of, long courses that people enrol on yeah yeah so the 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 life drawing online is a way for people to experience a very new way of doing life drawing mm -hmm. but with a real 
in a way which is very much rooted in classical tradition. So Hellenistic tradition, but also Renaissance tradition. Mm -hmm. And those two traditions are very connected because the Renaissance was all about reviving Hellenism. And that's Hellenism is really one of my chief, it's kind of <laughs> my main sort of value, really. Yeah, yeah. And um, so the life drawing online is, is very much like that. And the, the models bring an awful, an awfully fantastic level of creativity to all of the sessions. I work mm. with amazing life models. Mm. And um, we, we look at movement, we look at different artists that we're both interested in when we collaborate with the life models. And so that's really interdisciplinary. But then the, um, the longer courses really focus on Renaissance drawing mostly. And there are a range of different six week courses. They're like qu short intensive programs Mm. And um, they range from, you know, currently teaching one on Leonardo's process of drawing the head and face. So how Leonardo would actually start a drawing of the head and how he would place the eyes in and what sort of formula he would use to build up the face. And it's very different to the academic drawing. It's very yeah. different to um, any modern kind of drawing. Early modern drawing is something that I've been trying to understand my, you know, ever since I started drawing. And um, I use my sort of historical research, obviously my first degree is in history, and then the, my MA is uh, in philosophy. And I sort of use all my interdisciplinary um, background to reconstruct um, the step-by-step -step method of, the, of these artists in the 16th and 15th centuries, especially the 15th century. Mm -hmm. So working on Leonardo a lot at the moment, um, and also his teacher, Verrocchio, mm -hmm. and the year-long courses that I teach are all about giving people the opportunity that I would have loved to have had. Um, and what I, you know, if I had a time machine, I would either go back to ancient Greece and be a student of Plato and Aristotle, you know, and be in that, or go back to the 15th century and be a student of uh, uh, Andrea del Verrocchio mm. in the 1460s mm. and 70s. Where, and that's where Leonardo was trained. That's where Pietro Perugino came of age. He, he ended up training Raphael. And it's where Domenico Ghirlandaio came of age, and he ended up being one of the leading fresco painters in Florence in the second half of the 15th century. Also trained um, Michelangelo. So in Verrocchio's workshop was this nexus of um, brilliant artists who were being trained by Verrocchio and influenced by Verrocchio. And it's where the sort of highest level of elite drawing was consolidated yeah. by Verrocchio. It's because he was a sculptor as well as a painter and he, he, he infused a more sculptural and uh, a plastic sensitivity to drawing, um, making it more, you know, more, making the, the drawn image, the line and tone on paper appear more um, like a three-dimensional form yeah. with, with movement and with life. So. Um, tell us a bit about how you came to do this, actually. I mean, where, when did it first, when did your first sort of love of art uh, come from? Was it sort of, were you, as a kid, were you interested? Or, I mean, was it something that you found out about for yourself? Kind, I, I did, I, I found out about it by myself. Um, but I also had a mum, I have a mum, who was really helpful um, and really encouraging of me to, to become more interested in, in history because she was really interested in, in history and in art. And she used to take me to natural, national trust houses and uh, I'd be really stimulated by the paintings mm. and the mm. artifacts that they had. Um, but it was when I was 16, you know, I went through these teenage years and after, you know, after being shown these things by my mum and being really, you know, my interest being really stimulated and initiated by my mum. Um, it was when I was, you know, did go through a period of being really nihilistic and lost as a teenager and as, a, as an older child, you know, and you know, didn't really have a type of music I was particularly interested in, didn't have no. a type of art I was particularly interested in, didn't have any kind of philosophy on life. I was just a nihilist and had a real difficulty finding meaning. And I remember being seven years old thinking, what is the point of me playing with my Lego here when ultimately we're all going to die? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I remember... It's like a Woody Allen film. There's a line very much like that in... He said, I don't need to do my homework because we're all going to die. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt like that. I genuinely felt like that when I was a child. And then when I was 17, 16, 17, when I started sixth form in Welling in Kent, I went to sixth form. I'm from Elton, but I went to sixth form. And there was those teachers at Welling sixth form in the art department. 
and uh, who who really made me think, fucking hell, I need to be an artist, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, going to the National Gallery, and then it was going to the National Gallery that, at the age of 16 that just, you know, it was just something I wanted to devour. It was something I just wanted to inhale. Yeah. It was something I wanted to understand. And so within about six months, you know, having gone to the National Gallery obsessively more than twice a week for, for six months, it just became... Uh, something that I had installed in my yes, mind, and yes. I'd I could categorise each period of art, which artists belonged to which period, and break the Renaissance down into separate decades, and knew which artists belonged to it. It was something that, through repeated experience and repeated exposure, I just completely absorbed into myself, and that interest came from wanting to be a part of that trajectory and wanting to have a a real content to that. Also, I think the deeply personal reasons is that I grew up without a father. Mm. And so I think that that, you know, the need for like uh, uh, the need for something like that, to you know, I think that was I think that became something I, I wanted to draw from and for for that to be where my DNA came from. Right. I see. So, so like your, your mother taking you around, uh, she wasn't in it was a pure interest of hers, was it? Or she just wanted you to be interested. She's interested. In it. She's really yeah. passionate about the Middle East. She loves all of this. Yeah. Yeah, my mum's delighted with all this. She attends my workshops and my life drawing yeah, classes. Yeah. And my mum really, really uh, loves this like I do. But obviously, I went down and, you know, I didn't, wasn't a single mother. I wasn't uh, raising four children on my own, one of which is, you know, quite severely disabled. And, you know, having all these difficulties, you know, and having to work to provide for her family is what yeah. my mum did. I, on the other hand... Um, had, you know, she gave me the opportunity yep. to, to, to actually pursue this. And, you know, when I set up the Renaissance workshop, I was actually working on a building site. I was actually working as a labourer for a carpen carpenter friend um, and then also uh, working for a roofer as a labourer while starting up the Renaissance workshop. And it was, this became an opportunity because it ended up, you know, it became an opportunity where I've been able to do, you know, to be really successful for, from it mm. um, because of, um, because that's what I've kind of been able to devote myself to. So to, to this extent, I've been able to really p devote, you know, given it everything I am at the moment. So, because you uh, know, the, the, the you, you mentioned, you know, because you were, you felt you were a nihilist or you felt nihilistic. Um, and... I'm assuming, therefore, that this growing sort of fascination, growing interest and love of what you saw in the National Gallery, that stopped the nihilism? Oh, Did gosh, it? yes. It was like, uh, it was like, there is something worth doing here. Yeah, yeah. There is something worth doing here. If I can just connect to Velasquez, yes. you know, if I can just find uh, a way of, having an authentic connection to this and what I do with my time and with my life and with my resources is kind of historical, then I'm not just in this time. I'm not just living in this time. Mm. And that creates, you know, that's less limited. It's less, that's actually meaningful. And also what you're connecting to is a tradition or a, a strand of ideas that has evolved mm. you know if you think about our position you know it, it was a gradual process of realization and, and you know an incremental development of realization for me that that led to me realizing that as people who belong to the western world we have this remarkable remarkable privilege a joyous privilege that we can traverse the history of the development of the Western imagination and the Western mind all the way back to its inception with Hesiod and Homo, with the, the Iliad, the Odyssey, mm. the Theogony, the works and days. And it, we can traverse all the way back the history and development of the Western mind from its very literary inception, mm. from the archaic period into the geometric and classical period and onwards, you know. And that we have the history of Western philosophy with the pre-Socratics and the Sophists, to Plato and Aristotle and uh, Epicurus and uh, the uh, the skeptics like Sextus Empiricus and uh, and uh, Aristotle and Plato. So we've got all these sort of you know we can traverse that entire yeah. history and development of the Western mind and the Western management, and that can actually you know being able to understand what has shaped meaning and value in the mm. Western mind, mm. you know that is incredibly empowering. Mm. 
you know, and that, that is incredible. That is something that is going to facilitate you achieving uh, an intellectual or artistic goal. Mm. And it's only through connecting to that history and understanding what shapes your mind will you have a chance of having a sort of self affirmation. Mm. Okay, so that's a kind of Nietzschean I idea as well. The idea of self affirmation yeah. being something that could potentially be meaningful, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to actually affirm of your existence, affirm of your life. And I think that the necessary prerequisite prerequisite of self-affirmation is having an understanding of the, the culture that has shaped who you are, to know who you are. Because yeah. when me or you look at the ambassadors, or if we look at a, an ancient Greek sculpture, so if we look at a, a sculpture in the British Museum, so if we look at Hypnos, the beautiful bronze statue of the head of Hypnos, it's a, a head with wings, mm -hmm. you know, we're not just looking at an object, we're looking at the depth of, the depth of, of ourselves. Yes. We're looking at our own the development of who we are, you know, the ancient parts of us. And it's funny, you know, because you mentioned, for example, take that picture. I remember when I first saw it when I was a kid, I, yeah. I got very much via history. You know, it was it, via a fascination with 16th century Henry VIII and all of that. Um, to me, it just meant, it, to me, it just felt magnificent. That's the only way I can put it. Do you know, it just felt, it said something magnificent. Yeah. You know, and I and I didn't know, and all you know, many of the things you pointed out now, I didn't even know. I've never noticed the crucifix before, <laughs> but it felt sort of magnificent. It is I, magnificent. I, 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 I'm interested, you know, when you say about how it's empowering, and I think therefore as well liberating. I mean, oh, yes. genuinely, genuinely freeing. You know, I've often thought this when people say, you know, freedom is about choice and things like that. Well, actually, I've never thought it. If freedom is in the brain, a, a great to a great extent, freedom. If you feel really free, it's a mental thing. But um, do you therefore think that you know all of those those possible possibilities are being traduced now? I mean, you know, when you talk about nihilism, it seems to me that our culture—and it's a bit what been two years since we spoke—is going through a period of such incredible self-destruction and nihilism that it's almost unbearable. I mean, for me anyway. I find it unbearable. The idea that um, tradition and uh, high art, high culture, Western philosophy, traditional Western art is somehow oppressive. Mm. You know, it's, that is just so categorically wrong. Mm. Anyone in the entire world can resonate with and find meaning and value mm. in traditional Western art. And I think that anyone from any background can be deep, you know, and why, and how is it oppressive or how is, you know, I don't, I think I find it really, really disheartening when I feel as though people would discourage pe other people, you know, people would, would discourage people who yeah. aren't from a traditional or what would they might think of as a traditional Western background, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm of a mixed background, I'm mixed race, you know, so, and, and, and I don't feel as though I'm in any way not connected to traditional Western yeah, art yeah. and culture, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I think that anyone, you know, it's, 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 a, it's what has shaped this world. It's what shapes our society and our culture. And I think that being able to speak well about David Hume or Immanuel Kant or Descartes or Spinoza is going to unlock your potential in society. Because well, we have a case recently, sorry uh, to interrupt there, John, but, you know, where, for example, David Hume, I think the building in Scotland, the University of Scotland was renamed. Dropped the name. Dropped after the name or yeah. something like that. that. That is an example of what I meant, really. I mean, it is this kind of astonishing. I mean, I wonder when you have, you know, been involved with the ac academic world, the artistic ac academic world, do you feel that you are ploughing very much a singular, lonely Faro, in a way. I mean, because the general arts and cultural establishment is just, the whole emphasis is different, isn't it? It's all about basically judging people on the level of their victimhood or the, their uh, oppressor status, isn't it, really? Well, I feel like there's, yeah, there's in, in th that kind of environment at the moment and in the arts, um, I think that well, what I'm aware of, it, what, what I'm se very sensitive to, or what I was really quite disturbed by, is the widespread feeling or insecurity in art, in the arts and in academia, yeah. 
that people who are not descended biologically or ethnically from David Hume, Descartes, mm. Spinoza, Leibniz, because they have a different um, racial ancestry, that it's uh, going to be more difficult for them to yeah. understand mm. it or that... There's also this ridiculous idea, which I have a real problem with, that there's this assumption that if you were to take all of Western, you know, Western intellectual history and Western letters and sort of internalise them and for that to be your culture, that you would end up as a, a, a you would end up as being inherently racist yeah. and you'd end up being, you know, if you were to be rooted in Western culture, that it would just lead you tele teleologically to fascism mm. in that the Enlightenment, you know, that if you were to be, if your ideas were rooted in Western Enlightenment thinking, that you would end up being uh, a white supremacist, mm -hmm. you know. What the mistake of, that this makes, you know, several el elementary and historical errors are that the Enlightenment was a seething vortex of contradiction. Mm. You know, the two titanic figures of the Enlightenment, a human can't, think very, very different things mm. about the origins of morality. Mm. Mm. Or if you think about the very, very early Enlightenment or sort of um, pre-Enlightenment thinkers like Descartes and Hobbes, very, very, very different thinkers, very, very yeah, different yeah. conclusions about the nature of reality and the nature of the mind, the nature of reason and the, the potential powers of reason. They think totally, totally different things. Now, there is an idea in academia that there's a problem with the fact that these thinkers are all, all white men and that that is somehow um, not an inclusive environment and that, you know, that needs to change. If we're going to study the history of philosophy, um, we need to sort of uh, diversify that, um, the, the ethnic origins of the thinkers that we're teaching in order to make it more inclusive. Mm. I heard this phrase in sort of discussions among students and academics that, you know, if we're going to study philosophy, we're going to study the philosophy of mind. If we're going to study the philosophy of, um, if we're going to study the history of ethics or we're going to study morality, we're not studying, you know, thinkers from across the world. We're, we're, we're essentially homing in on thinkers that are pale, stale and male. Mm. And that's a phrase I heard and I was mm. totally repulsed by mm. it. I found that really quite, really disturbing and, and quite mm. upsetting, being the only, possibly the only non white person <laughs> there. You know, so at least, you know, it's a yeah. very, it's all very bourgeois yeah, sort of yeah. thing. And I, you know, the conclusion I came to in my head is that, well, hang on a minute, look, we, we can establish very quickly that Descartes and Hobbes think totally different things. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to say that they're, the fact that they're both white, it somehow makes them part of the same thing, even though they think completely different things, you know, diametrically opposed mm -hmm. to many of them, then somehow, you know, I can take part in that discussion, actually. But saying that they are part, that, they're, that the fact that they share the same coloured skin is, is what makes them the part, a part of the same culture. Yeah, yeah. That, that is what... That's what excludes me. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, yeah. that's what you know. The, the idea that the idea that you know, the pale, stale, and male, or the you know, the, the fact that these thinkers are white from Descartes, and you know, you know, the idea that this would naturally, organically culminate in a monolithic sort of form of of, of white supremacy or fascism, is totally deranged. But also, don't you think it's a cover? This kind of ideology is a cover, actually, for good old-fashioned ignorance. I mean. The level, the depth of your knowledge about what you talk about, what you teach, um, is missing, I would say, in many of these cases. In fact, you know, the people running our institutions now actually are quite philistine. I mean, you could say that, you know, whether it's in, in the galleries or the museums, and I think we've seen, you know, examples of that over the past couple of years, you know, that do they even really know or care, actually, about what they're meant to be curating? Yeah, I think that there it's it's just uh, it's it's difficult for me to really understand what good would ever come out of mm. this thinking. And I take a very Mandevillian uh, analysis or view on this. It, it appears to be a great virtue. They want to appear as though they're making a more inclusive and progressive environment 
for people like me, lucky me. <laughs> you know, they want to appear. They want to appear that they're uh, that they're that they're, they're that they're unlocking people's potential by yeah, yeah. by 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 alienating by 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 covering up what's happened in the Western world, which is really what is what's going to empower them. You know, it's like don't look at that. You know, look at things that are more suitable for for your. You know, you don't look like you don't look like Heraclitus. So why would you want to read the pre yeah. You know, I don't think that I think so. I think that this that, that might appear as virtue. But the reality is, is that it's an absolute. It's it's like it's it's like a it's not very it, I don't think that that's very powerful. I think the most empowering thing for people if they want to fulfill their aims of creating a more inclusive and and uh, a more empowered and increasingly increasingly diverse empowered base of people you know do that genuine progressive thing yep. it would be to stop alienating people like me by by and, and people you know people who oh, to stop stop alienating everyone you know it doesn't yeah, like just alienate yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, everyone yeah. the idea that you know i find it absolutely yeah, appalling yeah. um this idea that you know you know all these thinkers of in the tr traditional western philosophy from Homer and Hesiod all the way up to Nietzsche in the early 19th, in the late 19th century, early uh, beginning of the 20th century, it's that, yeah. that trajectory. Um, they all think very different things. They all think very differently about lots of different things. You know, Nietzsche is a completely radical thinker. Mm. Uh, Kant has probably introduced the most epochal ideas about reason being the ultimate source for morals. Mm. You know, reason in and of itself being the ultimate source for moral laws. And, and that these things that all have very diametrically opposed opinions on so many different top topics that somehow their whiteness turns them into uh, a, 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 a culture that that is what yeah. connects them and unifies them and yeah. and separates them from from you know that that to me is quite disturbing. Do you think um, you know when you look at the contemporary art scene, uh, say over the past twenty years or so? Um, not that you do look at it much, I don't know. No, I do, I do. There's lots of contemporary art I really love, actually. Do you think people can still get the same kind of empowerment? Because uh, I know you're talking about knowledge over a long period, but if they are going to just look at contemporary art, do you think they can get the same thing that we maybe looked at in that? I think with certain, con with some, con with really good contemporary art, yeah. I mean, mm. there are great painters out there. Michael Boromans is a great contemporary painter, and he's actually loved in the art, institutions as well as by you know people with a more traditional sensitivity yeah. or sensibility about things he loves the history of art he loves yeah. the history of painting and he's you know, he's not an academic painter he's not one of these sort of atelier style copying everything but he's a great contemporary painter figurative adrian Gini from romania he made a very sudden rise into the art scene in mm. 2015 or thereabouts mm. and you know he's really interested in 20th century history and he combines abstraction with figuration mm. with realism and that's that you know amazing artworks and then there's also i mean someone who's been around very well established now wilhelm sasnell the polish painter paints from photographs he takes photographs from all different sources and you know, and and these are artists who are all incredibly intelligent and do understand a tremendous amount not just about art history but also sort of 20th century history and there's also luke Toymans from belgium who who's really interested in 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 reflecting on European history and l also paints beautiful still lives and in, in, in a very contemporary way. I think when people talk about contemporary art, people say modern art. What do you think of modern art? Yes, yes. It always mean stuff like um, always stuff that is somehow related to Duchamp with the ready-made sort of the found materials and the sort of assemblages mm. of ready-made and the conceptual sort of mm. installation-based stuff that is totally um, well, meaningless and... Rubbish, uh, I think. I mean, it's just yeah. a, it's a dead end, it seems to me. Yeah, I think to a large extent it is. There are certain cl really clever things that are there, um, certain really, really clever um, examples of that sort of work, but in, in, in large, it's, it's um, utter nonsense, I think. You've had quite a, a, an interesting life so far. Uh, you're only 32, aren't you? But, uh, John, because uh, you were... This is, I was quite a su surprised. You were a pretty, um, you know, well-known cage fighter, weren't you, at one point? Well, well-known. Are you still one, by the way? No, no. Well, I, I, I had a couple of uh, semi-professional fights, okay, and uh, I really, really enjoyed it. I mm. really, really like 
fighting. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but it's something you know. That's I've been, going to be a clip. <laughs> I really like fighting. I've been I've been involved with uh, martial arts and unarmed, you know, yeah. combat since I was really young. You know, so. As I mentioned earlier, I did grow up without a dad, and so my mum didn't only encourage me to get involved in culture and history and that sort of thing, but also got me into uh, martial arts. And the one that I became most passionate about is Greco-Roman wrestling, yeah. the uh, ancient Greek wrestling, which is very much what you see in the terracottas and in the sculptures in the British Museum, yeah. if you look at the pictures of the depictions of wrestlers. And I had this amazing wrestling coach and um called marius from poland and uh he man you feel like you're actually having a physical contact with hellenism yes you feel like you're having a physical contact with the past not only in the artistic side but also in like you're, you're doing the physical moves that you know plato was a wrestler really it's that's why he was called plato because he was so broad platon Pla good lord i had no idea yeah. so plato was actually a, a real and so i think I think that intellectuals and artists ought to be warriors as well. You know, I think that you know you ought to have. A, I think I think that it's good for 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 us to to be able to sort of fight and that sort of thing. Although you know, it's not good to fight in the street. Of course, I like, don't mean that. I mean like uh, you mean because of combat. Yeah, you, good, good. It's very good for you. It's very very good, and I love it. I love it. I'd get a real surge of energy. You know, I, just, I like sparring, and I haven't trained in a, a martial arts gym since um, the pandemic because I have been sort of working from home all yeah. the time and I've just started running again trying to get myself back in shape but I'm desperately desperately want to get back into the gym my wrestling coach has moved to Poland permanently and there will be ne never someone as good as him to yeah, teach yeah, yeah. proper Greco-Roman wrestling in England um, but Muay Thai is another, art, is another martial art that I absolutely love these are the martial arts that are most appropriate for proper cage fighting as well mm -hmm. um, Muay Thai Greco-Roman wrestling freestyle wrestling and Brazil in jiu-jitsu and um, you can do pretty well just with Muay Thai which is the Thai Thai kickboxing mm. and Greco-Roman wrestling but you you, you meant you, you did say it would be good for artists to do this this mm -hmm. um, yeah. or for that matter anyone but yeah um, what what kind of what other sort of or maybe intellectual uh, thread would you put between the two there I mean because I, I said to you before we came on, on air that in fact there is this kind of there's a bit of a slight sort of mini movement having a moment of people who are, would you say conservative, younger people who are conservative, but boxing and things like this certainly has a big role huh. in it and, and a kind of physical discipline and all of that. I'm glad to hear that that's making yeah. a revival and that, you know, because I, I, you do worry about um, men going through, you know, masculinity, going through uh, a, a lapse, you know, mm. and, uh, you know, uh, so it's good, good. I think you know it's good. It's good. It's healthy, yeah. isn't it? And uh, so I'm glad to hear that. But yeah. also, I think that there's an intellectual thread joining up with the artistic and intellectual stuff. I think that it comes down to um, nobilis, aristocraticism. Yes. And yes. that's another aspect of, of of the Hellenic life and the Hellenic vision of selfhood and the Hellenic vision of the world and and humanity's place in nature. The for us to excel and to fulfill our being, essentially, to be self-becoming, yeah. to become of ourselves, um, one has to exert virtue and embody virtue. Mm. And um, if you look at the symbols of aristocraticism in ancient Greek art, these are young athletes, the athletic phys figure, that the, 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 the embodiment of self-overcoming, of courage, of temperance, mm. of prudence, Mm. Okay, is embodiment is embodied physically in the athlete. Mm. So, in the, so the image of of, arist of aristocracy of no, and I'm not talking about sort of like the monarch yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and the, the sort of uh, inherited, yeah. but being an aristocrat by mm. nature. That's the Aristotelian aristocrat. Mm. The Hellenic aristocrat is someone who, yes, they inherit wealth and they own land and they own slaves and they own um, various, you know, in, in the classical Greek world. But. Um, but the sort of precepts or, or, or the, the precepts of aristocraticism or the elements of aristocraticism is the noble self. Yeah. And it's that Hellenic sort of thing that I'm connected to. And so it's the artistic side is, you know, Apelles, the great uh, a painter of ancient Greece and uh, Polycletus, the great sculptor and Lysippus, great sculptor and the great thinkers. These are all the, the high, the highest manifestations of selfhood. Yeah. You know, and I think they're all deeply connected around the idea of nobilis, yes, nobility, yes. aristocraticism, being yeah. an organic, natural aristocrat. 
where, uh, whereas now I think our idea of, uh, you know, self if you like, self ennoblement is about being a work in progress. It's, it, you know, you hear this, this saying all the time, it's about looking inwards and going back. And navel gazing. Navel gazing in a big way. But I mean, that is just defeat, isn't it? Yes. I mean, that is just, uh, is just, a, uh, is just uh, an appalling excuse to do nothing. <laughs> well, no one can accuse you of doing nothing. Um, how can people uh, get, how can they get to the Renaissance workshop? Is Instagram, is it, or is it on uh, with a website or what? We'll put these links under our talk. But so the RenaissanceWorkshop.com is the website, yeah. and on the home on the landing page, there's uh, an email sign up, and if you sign up on that, you get invites to the free workshop every week, and you also get notifications and updates about courses. They're so not opportunities that you can enrol on. And uh, Instagram is the main sort of social media platform that I use at the moment. And you've got loads of followers on there now, haven't you? I mean... You a few know, thousand, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really been going. Thanks so much for coming back, actually. Not, John, I've, I've got a feeling you'll probably be back again not that, um, you know, not that far away. As I say, we're doing this six-parter on the West, uh, which Mark Sibwell is, is uh, writing at the moment. And um, I can see your face cropping up there, if you, if you, wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind. But, uh, I'd be delighted. Thanks very much indeed, John. Thank you. Uh, that's it for this week, so what you're saying is we shall see you next time. Thank you very much. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.